So my name is Gabby Hughes, and i um, very happy to, to see all of you here and to see or see your names on the online screen here. Um, we're going to be talking about planting spring perennials and especially spring ephemerals. And we'll talk about what those are and how that's that the slight difference between ephemeral and just a, a garden variety perennial. But we're going to talk about planting those in the fall. And what I'm going to do is just give you a basic overview of what a spring ephemeral is and some of the survival strategies of our native spring um, wildflowers. Uh, and I'm also going to give you just some slides that show you some of the possibilities. Um, many of these species are shade loving. They have kind of specific needs. So if you are the gardener that has that shady spot in your yard and you're like, what do I do here? <laughs> these may be the plants for you. Um, so um, if you have a great big sunny area, these, these, you may want to start now planting some shrubs and trees to sort of give yourself some shade <laughs> in the coming years for these because there are, are some really nice plants. Um, some of them will do well in partial sun as well um, and we'll talk about that. Uh, after we go over some of the plants, the end of the program, we're going to be talking about specifically how you plant them now. Okay, so what are the, what are the strategies for doing that? And I know um, doing the Certified Backyard Habitat program, I have had a lot of questions about that, so we're going to try and address some of those. And then I'm also going to go over briefly, um, I know those of you that I've met in person, we do talk about this uh, iNaturalist, and you see me using iNaturalist a lot. So I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the iNaturalist program, the app, how, you, how it can be helpful for you, and how you can use it to be helpful to our overall understanding of where plants and animals live and how they're doing. So um, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. I have so much stuff on my podium here, I can't find, <laughs> couldn't find my mouse. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And just to make sure everybody at home, you should just be seeing the Audubon Society of Western Pennsylvania logo on your screen right now. And if anybody, if you're not seeing that, please let me know. And also, um, I just want to make sure that, uh, whoop, now I can't see it, that uh, you can hear me as well. I'm going to stop sharing for one second here and make sure my PowerPoint is giving me a little bit of a, a little bit of a hiccup right now. All right, there we go. All right, we have some folks outside. <laughs> All right, I am going to try this screen share again and see if it works better. Okay. Nope. All right, um, folks at home, if somebody could just let me know, I'm going to advance the slide and just let me know if it's advancing for you. Did it advance for you at home? Somebody can just give me a high sign or a yes. Let's see. Nope. Okay, hang on just a sec. Let me try and fix this. For some reason, it's not working on this. And I apologize. I usually don't have a problem with these. For some reason, it's giving me a problem today. Oh, I know what we have to do. There we go. Duplicate. There we go. Sorry about that, folks. All right, now give me two seconds and then we should be fine. All right, give me, give me one second and now. Da, da, da. All right, everybody at home should be seeing the 
planting spring perennials in the fall. Is that what we're seeing at home? Give me a thumbs up or a yay. Barb, I, ha I have Barb saying yes. So I can't, we're gonna go ahead and get started then. Woo, all right. So <laughs> spring perennials in the fall. Um, now the thing about spring, the, a lot of our spring ephemerals and our spring blooming plants, they don't look like much right now. So most nurseries, including us, we don't have a lot of spring perennials or spring ephemerals out there for sale because you would literally be looking at an empty pot. Um, or if it's not an empty pot, it would look like a pot with a, a little brown stem and some curled up leaves right now. But that doesn't mean that that little pot can't be planted. This is actually, fall is actually a really good time to plant these um, spring ephemerals and regular perennials. And so we're gonna talk about that. But first, we should probably go over what in the world is a spring ephemeral. We're gonna skip over that because I think most of you know who we are. So um, our Audubon Center for Native Plants, those of you that are here with us right now, you've been able to see our native plant sales area. Many of you may not have ever seen our propagation area. So across the parking lot, we have a big nursery setup um, where we grow, um, collect seeds and propagate from seed uh, many of our native plant species from here in Western Pennsylvania. And Roxanne Swan is actually in charge of that. And she does a phenomenal job. She has a small army of volunteers that help her with that. And this year, many of the volunteers have not been coming in because of COVID. So Roxanne has really taken on a, a big chunk of that herself. So it's really amazing when you go up there and you see all of the beautiful plants on offer. It's amazing the amount of work that she's been able to get done. Um, especially this year, any year, but especially this year. Um, but the reason we have that Native Plant Center is because we believe and we know and science knows that if you want all the beautiful bird species and insect species and mammals and even the reptiles and amphibians, our native plants are the key to having those. They are the key part of the ecosystem that makes that possible. All of these native plants have relationships with these animals that have been developed over eons. And the, they don't have those relationships with the cultivars and the ornamental plants that many of us have in our, our yards. Um, and combined with that, we have the disappearance of many native habitats right now. So whether through development or you know what have you, um, pollution, things like that. So, your backyard becomes a really key component to providing that natural habitat, that food and that shelter, um, and those relationships for a lot of these um, birds and insects and other species. So um, that's, that's part of our mission and we, we take it really seriously and we're very proud of it. And we're very proud of you all for taking part of that in that. So a native plant, um, another question I get a lot is what is a native native plant? So a native plant is a plant that has been here since before European settlement. That's the generally accepted definition of it. So, you know, when uh, George Washington and General Forbes and our first settlers were coming across Pennsylvania, these are plants that would have been here when they got here, okay, for the most part. Now, Oftentimes when you are buying plants, and, and the best way to, to tell if you have a native plant is to look at its scientific name, so its Latin name. Um, now in the um, nursery industry, sometimes they take those plants and they breed them a little bit. Um, they may select for certain traits and you know, cross certain plants back with each other. That's how you get a native R, um, which is like a native plant that had a little bit of, of, of selection done to it. And then the cultivars, which are the, some of the plants that you get that um, it may say it's a purple cone flower, but it doesn't look anything like a purple cone flower. It's got like double flowers and it might have like neon colors that you never see out in nature. So what we're talking about today are those native species. So the straight native species, which you would see if you went down in the woods today, um, those species down there. And as I mentioned, this, they're, they're so important to this overall connection. So 
for instance, the spice bush swallowtail butterfly in this picture. That butterfly may get nectar from some of the ornamentals that we have in our garden if those plants are, are providing nectar. But that swallowtail, its caterpillar is only going to eat spice bush leaves and sassafras leaves. And if it doesn't have those, it's not going to survive and you're not going to have the spice bush swallowtail. Um, the, uh, let's see, who else do we have here? Uh, the little mason bee down here in the corner or in the middle here and the bumblebee. Many of our bee species, our native bee species, are very particular about the types of pollen that they will feed their larva. Bees, they collect pollen to feed their developing larva. And some of them are pretty specific about the types of pollen that they'll, that they'll gather. And when you look at some of our ornamental species, when they make them look really pretty and have a double flower and have all these neat characteristics, sometimes they breed the pollen right out of it, or they might breed, breed them so that a bee can't actually access the pollen or the nectar. So these are important things to keep in mind. And then those caterpillars, and those bees, they are providing services like pollination. And this little caterpillar, it has, the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar actually has little eye spots to make it look like a snake so that it can keep this chickadee from eating it. Um, so that caterpillar is an important food source for animals like the black capped chickadee and for other animals that may then be food for our little rat snake over in the corner. I love rat snakes, I just think they're so cool. Such a neat animal. But so these plants are the keystone for all of these species in the ecosystem that they, that they depend on. And if you're looking for ideas for your yard, I think one of the best things to do is go for a walk in nature and look at what nature is doing and then kind of mimic that. So if you walk along a woodland trail um, and looking at what kinds of plants are there, and making sure that they're native plants, because we do have a lot of invasive plants out in our woodlands as well. Um, so, and uh, that's one of the things I'm gonna show you with iNaturalist is a really good idea to, to check and see what you have. But looking at the types of plants that are in the woodlands, but also looking at the arrangement of them. So noticing, I always tell groups when I'm out with groups, you walk into the woods, the woods are like an apartment building. So you've got the trees, which are the canopy, that's the penthouse apartment. And then you have all the floors down below it, which are providing food and shelter for all different kinds of animals. All right, so here's a little uh, robin, typically in one of those like mid floors of that apartment building. And one of the things that, that many of these spring ephemerals that we're gonna talk about today, many of them exist in that lower layer of that um, apartment building. And that's such an important layer. It provides food and cover for everything from soil invertebrates. It's providing cover for the soil itself, helping to keep moisture in it. Uh, and there are even a lot of nesting birds. Um, some of our spring migrants that actually nest in that forest understory. So things like oven birds, uh, for example, they actually build their nest down in that, that vegetation layer. Unfortunately, with our white-tailed deer, that's usually the layer that they're wiping out. So our white-tailed deer, one of the big problems with them is that they're taking out those bottom floors of that apartment building and um, removing a lot of that vegetation. Because like all of our other native species, they prefer and depend on native plants. And guess what they won't eat? All of those invasive species. So they're leaving things like garlic mustard and stilt grass and things like that. Um, so it kind of contributes to this, this loss of native species that we're having. So what is a spring ephemeral? I've been tossing that word around a little bit today and um, we might as well talk about what it is. So these are woodland, we would think of them as woodland wildflowers. These are plants that their strategy is to grow their above ground parts very early in the spring. And we're talking, some of these you'll see them out there in like late March, early April, when it's, it's actually pretty chilly still. But they're getting out there, they're getting their leaves, their stems, their flowers, and everything out there before the trees leaf out. 
So they're taking advantage of the sun filtering down onto the woodland before the forest really leaves out and shades everything out. They are, so we say make hay while the sun shines. Um, it's chilly, there aren't as many flying insects out. So they are attracting a lot of things like early flies and beetles that we don't necessarily think of when we're thinking of pollinators. And early bees like bumblebees can be really important for these, these um, spring ephemerals. And you'll see from the pictures, some of them really target specific groups of these pollinators. They tend to be really short too. You know how your, your sunflowers and you know a lot of your sun loving species, they take a while, but by the time they're done growing, they're like five, six, seven feet tall. Think of Joe Pieweed. It's like up above my head. These spring ephemerals, they don't have time to do that. They can't waste energy getting real tall and there's no point because by the time they get to be really tall, they're gonna be in the shade. So they have a very small stature. That also helps protect them during cold spells that we get in the spring. So that short stature helps to protect their tissues. It means they don't have as much out there to freeze. They oftentimes have kind of like an antifreeze component in them that protects them as well. And um, because they are um, doing all of this growth very early in the spring, um, and the temperatures aren't real, real warm. They need a lot of rich soil. They need a lot of soil moisture to help them keep up with photosynthesis and they need rich soil. So in your yard, you may have shade, but for a lot of these species, you really have to bump up the soil health or that hummus layer, the organic matter in that soil. So if you have a shady spot, but it's really pretty much straight clay, Many of these are not gonna do well. And you think about it, they're in a forest where every fall, they're getting this like bonanza of falling leaves. And those falling leaves are being decomposed um, by worms and fungi and bacteria. And that's enriching that soil. And that's really, really important for these plants. They need that really rich soil. All right, so rich, moist woods. Um, lots of moisture. These, these plants, I know they're tiny, but they are like in overdrive trying to get all of their growth done, setting flowers, setting seeds, um, doing all of that before the leaf out. That's an incredible amount of growth in a very short amount of time. So they're going through photosynthesis like you wouldn't believe. It's very, very um, energy intensive. So they need a lot of moisture, like I said, to help them do that, and they need that rich soil. And I should say, one of the reasons we call them ephemerals is not all of them, but most, a true spring ephemeral, that plant may be done completely, like, and below ground again. The, the above ground portion of it may be gone by, like, June. It may be completely, it'll look like it has died but underneath the ground, those roots are alive, they're growing, so that, but that's why we call it a spring ephemeral. Okay, so where is the perfect hab the natural habitat for these spring ephemerals? So here in Western Pennsylvania, we're in what's called the Pittsburgh Low Plateau, and we don't get m really mountains here until you head out into like the edge of Westmoreland County or up into Somerset County. That's where we start to get our mountains. And I know what you're all thinking, well, why do we have so many hills? We have Mount Washington right in downtown Pittsburgh. Mount Washington is not a mountain. Mount Washington is a mountain in New Hampshire, <laughs> but not here. Um, so where do we get all of these hills? Well, if you drive across the bridges in Pittsburgh and you look at the hillsides, they're basically flat on top. They have a little bit of wave to them, but for the most part, they're flat, and then they have valleys. Our topography here is cut by rivers and streams. So when you look at our hillsides, our hillsides are actually valley slopes. And um, so this is just a diagram of, of a typical valley slope here. And because those valleys can be fairly deep, they can actually be pretty shaded. And so those shady valleys and the stream bottoms 
That's where these spring ephemerals really thrive. Now, the interesting thing is because these valleys face in different, the streams, you know, because of the way the stream meanders, these valleys and slopes face different directions. And the direction that it faces influences what kind of plants grow there. So if you have a straight east-west flowing valley, and one side of the valley slope faces north, and one side of the valley slope faces south, this north-facing slope here in the northern hemisphere, the sun is going to travel along this slope and shine on that south-facing slope. This area is going to be very much more dry and sunnier. Um, this is going to be a lot shadier. This is where you're going to find those spring ephemerals in that shady kind of um, protected uh, habitat there. If we look, this is a picture from a trail about three miles from here. And it's a typical stream valley. This is actually Blue Run. Um, so it's right over by Dorseyville Middle School, if you're familiar with this area. And this valley runs east to west. And so that means that this side of the slope faces north and this side faces south. This is literally like maybe 15 feet across. And look at the difference in the plant communities there. It's striking, absolutely striking. This is very deciduous over here on um, the, the south facing slope. It's a drier plant community. You don't find a lot of spring ephemerals here. Over here, it's where you have your eastern hemlock. It's full of ferns and mosses and you have a, a really, um, you have a multitude of these spring wildflowers there. It's really beautiful. Now, not all of our valleys run east to west like this. Some of them run more north to south. And um, those, uh, with those valleys, you tend to see this in a slightly more moderated um, fashion. So um, if it's an east facing slope, uh, it'll receive morning sunlight. So depending on how deep that slope is or how, how, how narrow that valley is and how much sun it gets, that will have an effect on the plant community there. Also our east um, facing slopes tend to be a little bit more protected from the prevailing winds here. So these spring ephemerals, the, the, these slopes are where you're going to look for those plants. And then in your yard, this is something you want to think about. What kind of conditions do you have in your yard that might support these? Now, that's not to say that these plants can't do well in your yard. These Virginia bluebells, you'll see a lot of these in partial sun to sh or part shade to shade gardens. It's a beautiful little plant and really does nicely in a backyard where you have similar conditions. But it's also a plant that it's going to die back. That entire plant is going to be gone by June for the most part. Um, trout lily, this is like classic spring ephemeral. These trout lilies, you, you start to see their leaves in like March. You, you get the flowers in April and then by the end of May, those, those leaves are gone. They actually degrade back into the soil. They help to put phosphorus and other nutrients back into the soil, so they're really, really important. And then one of our most famous is trillium. We have a, a number of trillium species here in Western Pennsylvania, and the one we're looking at here is trillium grandiflora. That's a large flowered trillium. But again, similar strategy. They are out there, they are getting their their above ground portion done and um, then setting seeds and they're done for the year. So we talked about this a little bit, that these plants that we're focusing on, they are like deer candy, deer love them. And if you have an area where you're not protecting these flowers from the deer, then the deer will come in and they will just they can decimate an entire area. Uh, here in Fox Chapel, we have a trail called Trillium Trail. And about 20 odd years ago, people came out one spring and the trillium just literally disappeared because of the deer. Uh, the problem is plants like this garlic mustard, they do not eat them. They don't prefer them. That's it. They're like any other native species. Like we said, they don't really know what to do with some of these non-native invasive species. And so without the competition from the native plants, this garlic mustard can easily take over a forest or a woodland. 
And so those of you who are in our Certified Backyard Habitat program, when I'm saying, oh, you might want to get rid of this invasive plant or that invasive plant, part of it is because it's an invasive plant in your yard, but the other part is that, that it can escape into wild areas and then it can really cut down on the number of native species that we have in wild woodlands and, and other areas. So yeah, deer, what they've found, they've done studies that once they exclude the deer and keep them out of an area or cut down on their numbers, then the native species can come back and hold their own. So it's actually pretty cool. All right, so pollination, there are a wide variety of strategies for these spring ephemerals. Um, this, uh, I think this is a meadow rue there. Uh, some of them are wind pollinated. So this has a very, very simple flower. It's not very showy. That pollen travels on the wind, but some of them, many of our showy wind, uh, spring ephemerals, they are actually being pollinated by insects. And like I said, these insects, some of them, like the, there's a type of trillium, trillium the red trillium or wake robin, it's a beautiful flower, but if you get your nose right up close to it, it smells awful. It smells horrible. And it is, it has that smell to attract flies and beetles and insects that are attracted to things like rotting meat. And I know, right, gross? Um, skunk cabbage, that's part of its, you know, strategy. Um, so these, not only are they relying on some of these or um, animals to pollinate them, but some of them are also relying on them to spread their seeds. Now, there are plenty of wildflowers out there, and even in the spring, that spread their seeds via <laughs> the wind. But you tend to see that strategy a lot more out here in the meadows, where you have an ample source of wind. If you think about the forest, you know, the forest provides a lot of cover from wind. So if you're a small little plant that doesn't sit up very high and you're being protected from the wind by the trees and the shrubs, you don't really want wind pollination as one of your strategies. So if we look at this, this dandelion, it's sitting out there, it's out in the lawn, it has ready access to the wind, wind or wind, excuse me, spreading your seeds by the wind. Spreading your seeds by the wind is a great strategy, but for these little forest wildflowers, it doesn't work as well. So some of the other um, strategies that they have, wild geranium, this actually is uh, a seed capsule that's actually been, it has popped open. They catapult their seeds out into the woods. So it gets a little thing called a crane's bill. So this is where the center of the flower was. And as that little crane's bill dries out, eventually it snaps open. So these four little structures spring back and snap open and fling the seeds out into the woods. A really good strategy for a lot of these plants is to stick to either you or your dog or a deer or what have you. Um, so having their seeds stick to you and have you pull them off or your dog pull them off later and spread them is a really great idea too. But a vast number of these spring wildflowers use animals and specifically ants. Many of these use ants. Some of them will use birds to spread their seeds. So if they make a berry, they're using a bird to eat the seed, eat the fruit, and then go to the bathroom later on and, and um, deposit the seed that way. But ants, do a lot of seed spreading. And the way they do it is really, really cool. It even has its own name. It's called myrmecochery. And I probably said that wrong. But the idea is these seeds, so these are trillium seeds right over here, and these are bloodroot seeds. The seed actually comes with a bonus. So it, depending on the plant, it has, it's a slightly different structure or it goes by a slightly different name. But the idea is that it has this little, appendage that's actually sweet and its only job is to attract ants. The ants pick up the seed and many of these flowers actually drop their seeds on the ground like a little salt shaker. The ants come along, they pick up these seeds, take them back to their little ant colonies, their little burrows, which are usually in the ground, right? They eat off the sugary part and then they don't want the seed, they chuck the seed in their little compost piles. And so it's a great way for the plant to spread its seeds. Really cool idea. 
And um, like I said, trilliums, this is definitely the way trilliums spread their seeds, uh, really, really dependent on ants to help them do that. And for trillium, you know, spreading their seeds is very important. They do have an underground tuber um, or root system, but um, they do need to spread those seeds and colonize other areas. Trilliums, they really are beautiful. They're an absolutely stunning plant. We don't ever recommend taking this or any of the spring ephemerals out of the wild um, to put in your backyard. These trilliums, it takes them from the time they sprout as a seed, it takes them seven years to actually produce a flower. <coughs> so the first time that plant comes out of the ground, it's basically got like one little leaf. And for the next four or five years, it'll just be a very small, like three-leaved plant. It takes seven years for it to get to the stage where it can flower. So it's really important not to, to pull these guys out of the ground. This is, uh, so this is that wake robin trillium, the one, the red trillium that has the really lovely smell. <laughs> um, another one of our trilliums, this is um, the large flowering trillium grandiflorum. And this one is really cool. This is called toad shade trillium. And it doesn't ever open more than this. It's also called Cecil Trillium because the, the flower just stays closed like that. So it's gonna need a bee or something else to, to sort of pry it open and get to the pollen there. And this is a close up of the seeds that are produced in the seed capsule there. Bloodroot, this is another spring ephemeral. This is, uh, again, the flowers. It's an absolutely beautiful flower. The flower is about I mean, think of something that's a, a little, maybe the size of a, of a tennis ball in diameter. Um, and these flowers come out very early in the spring. So we're seeing these in April. And they actually, the flower is coming out at the same time that the leaf is opening up. They have a very distinctive leaf. Now you'll see the leaf for much longer, you know, once the flower is gone. The leaf does persist and has a really beautiful leaf. It's got this like really interesting scallop shape to it. Um, really, you know, lovely woodland wildflower. And again, they have these tubers underground, the rootstock there. Um, and when you're planting these in the fall, this is what you'd be planting, basically this. Another neat thing about bloodroot, this is a UV filter of the plant. So this is what we see, this is what a bee sees. Um, so this is the, the image to a bee and these pollen, the stamens become a guide to show the bee exactly where to go to get nectar from that plant. Uh, twin leaf, uh, somewhat similar, but another uh, spring wildflower. We actually do sell these uh, for, they, they go really quickly though. This is any of these spring ephemeral, ephemerals, they tend to go very quickly in the spring here at our nursery and other nurseries because they're so popular. Wild ginger, I always recommend this as a ground cover if you have a shady area that you want to um, have a ground cover because this one is really not an ephemeral so much because the leaf does persist um, for quite a long time. Wild ginger has a really unique flower. You can't see it from above, but it's got this little flower that hangs out right at the base of the plant. And again, you notice that color kind of looks like rotting meat, right? It's down at the bottom, and most scientists think that it is down there to attract like beetles, some ground, you know, moving beetles and flies um, that wouldn't be attracted, that, you know, might not be attracted to uh, your garden variety flower and that are out in the early spring when this is blooming. And as an aside, wild ginger, it, does have an edible root. It's not where we get the ginger spice that we use. That's actually um, from uh, Jamaican ginger, but it was eaten by um, native people, indigenous people here as a candy and pioneers. I don't necessarily recommend doing that now because you have to pull up the plant and take the root to do that. This is a just really early spring wildflower. And I always go searching for this every spring. It's called um, hepatica. There's sharp-lobed hepatica and round-lobed hepatica. And these leaves will persist. In fact, the leaves of hepatica are actually persistent through the winter. They keep their leaves out through the winter and then send up a new set of leaves 
in the spring as the plant's flowering. Um, but another very lovely little woodland species. And it gets its name, this means like liver, because of the shape of the leaves. I already talked about trout lily a little bit. This is the leaf for trout lily. It looks like a trout. <laughs> and it, it, it does come out right around trout season. These little flowers, they're really cool. They follow the sun throughout the day. So they will track the sun as it moves. And if you get a cloudy day, they won't open. And that's the case for some of these spring ephemerals. They don't even bother opening on a cloudy day because the, um, if they're not gonna, if it's too cold for insects to be out and about flying, then there's really no point in them opening. So they'll just stay closed. Um, rue anemones, this is, and this is one you will see, um, rue anemone and meadow rue and things like that. This is a real nice garden addition because the leaves are just a really pretty, delicate leaf. The, the flower is a nice little delicate white flower, but the leaf, I think the foliage is really pretty for these as well. And here's wood anemone, very similar. All right, so um, this, this is another true spring ephemeral. You don't really see it planted in many yards. You see it in the woodlands quite a bit. Um, this is Dutchman's breeches, and it gets its name, breeches, because the flower looks like a little, like a pantaloon, an old-fashioned old fashioned underwear. <laughs> so um, this one is one that comes out very early in the spring in April, and the foliage does die back by June. So it starts to yellow and die back. So if you're putting these in your garden, you want to pair them with something like coral bells or ferns that are going to have a, a foliage that's going to persist, that can take over for them when they die back. But these are neat. They actually are specifically trying to attack, attract bumblebees. And the nectar is way up in the little pants of the flower. And it takes a long tongue of a bumblebee to actually reach that nectar. And this, now this one is one that I do see a lot in people's gardens and with good reason. Um, wild columbine. There are a lot of columbines that are cultivars that you'll see out there that will have like really grape purple and weird color combinations. And I think the wild columbine has such an exceptionally beautiful flower on its own. I don't think you have to go with a cultivar for this. Um, so this one's gonna be blooming slightly later. So you see this one in May um, and into June even. But again, that same strategy, these very long spurs to attract long-tongued bumblebees. Um, you could even get hummingbirds on these. but. For these, their foliage will persist throughout the summer. So it, this, this one, the foliage is not gonna die back on it. And this one too, they tend to be a little bit more forgiving. They don't have to be in deep shade. You can have these, these flowers in a more open shade or partial shade. So they're, they're pretty adaptable to that. If you do have a wetland area, one of our weirdo flowers is skunk cabbage. And it is a pretty, I mean, it's not one that most of us can do. They actually absolutely have to have a wetland. But if you're out there on your spring walks and you come along a stream bottom, um, you'll oftentimes see this weird pod. And that's actually the flower of the skunk cabbage. And this you can see in February. It'll open up in February. In fact, sometimes there's still snow on the ground. And it can actually generate a little bit of heat um, and melt the snow around it. And it provides a little refuge for insects um, that can come and collect the pollen. Um, and it also has that smell and that color that looks like rotting meat. Stone crop, I, this is not an ephemeral. So this one does bloom in the spring. It has a beautiful spray of white flowers in the spring, but the leaves will persist on this one. So you will have the leaves all throughout the summer. This is a succulent, so it has these, it's a sedum, has these really small fleshy leaves. It's beautiful as a ground cover in shade or open shade. Um, you don't have to have really great soil for this. If you have an area that has a lot of rocks, um, this is a good one for that. Um, really, really cool ground cover plant. And this one is easy to plant, you know, because you'll still have the foliage right now. Um, and it'll, it'll look, <laughs> it won't look all dead and dying. 
Whoop, sorry about that. Tooth wart. So this tooth wart is such a sad story. <laughs> it's such a cool little plant. It's in the mustard family, and there here we have primarily two varieties: this broadleaf tooth wart and the cutleaf tooth wart. This is in the mustard family, and all of the mustard plants have these little flowers that have four petals, and they almost make like a little X shape. So this is one of those woodland ephemerals that the deer come and mow down. They um, they love to eat these. Uh, so, and this is an important nectar source and pollen source for early bees. They even have like a little ultraviolet dot on the petals that the bees can see, but we can't see. But the deer will come and mow these flowers down. Now, one of the problems is there is a butterfly called the West Virginia white butterfly, and it lays its eggs on these leaves, and it can only lay its eggs on these toothworts, these native mustards. Now the deer come along, they eat them, and then we're left with garlic mustard. Garlic mustard comes in, which is also a mustard. And the West Virginia white butterfly will try to lay her little eggs on that mustard plant, but the caterpillars can't survive on it, and so they starve. So it's, it's a very sad little story and, and you know, a cautionary tale for invasive species in deer, but this, it, it is a great plant, and it's a nice addition to your yard. Foam flower is very similar. The leaves are very similar if you have uh, coral bells in your yard, uh, but it does have a, a, a showier flower than coral bells. Um, so it has this spray of white flowers um, early in the spring. So this is like an end of April, early May bloomer. Um, the leaves will persist a little bit longer too. Uh, and this is the, just a beautiful, kind of like a ground cover or a low, low um, addition to your shade garden. A lot of people have golden alexanders too. This one's going to get to be a little bit taller, Zizia, and um, will bloom a little bit later too. So it's a little bit later blooming and it will keep its foliage throughout the, grow the, the spring and summer um, on into fall. So I was just in somebody's garden yesterday and they had golden alexanders. You can see the leaves from this one. Jacob's Ladder, uh, really pretty purple flower. It has this um, kind of unique uh, compound leaf here. A early spring bloomer, but the foliage does persist. These do well in um, gardens. You'll see them a lot in people's gardens. They'll, they'll tolerate some sun, like some partial sun. Uh, but again, they do like a richer soil. So if you've just got straight clay, you want to amend that a little bit, put some leaf mulch down in there to sort of enrich the soil a little bit. And so Spring Beauty, another um, spring wildflower, very common in our woodlands. Uh, a little tiny flower. This one, the flowers persist for several weeks, so it's a longer blooming plant. The foliage itself is not much. It basically looks like grass leaves. So it's, um, it's one that, that if you have it in your garden, you're going to want to put it with some things that can fill out. But it is a cute little spring ephemeral. And this is another one that they, they actually shoot their seeds out into the woods. And spring ephemeral and the, the wild geranium, this, they both have those sort of like uh, landing strips on the petals. So they're kind of guides, nectar guides to show the insects where to get the nectar. Uh, wild geranium is a really great plant because it's not ephemeral. It does bloom in the spring, but these leaves, they have these wide like palmate leaves they are going to persist throughout spring and summer and into fall like they're still out right now so this is a really great like low growing kind of ground cover plant um really nice it spreads out really thickly um so this i i always recommend this for folks in their backyard if you're they're looking for like that part sun part shade kind of fill there it's a really nice plant and then um, violets, you can't go wrong with violets as a ground cover. Violets are spring, they're not ephemeral. So they are a spring blooming plant, um, but they're not an ephemeral. And there are like 50 different varieties of violets. Some of the really common ones around us 
the common blue violet, and they have leaves just at the ground level. Um, but these will actually spread into your yard, they'll spread into your lawn, they make a really nice addition to your lawn. Um, cream white violets and some of our other violets, they actually have a stalk or stem, and they'll have leaves all the way up the stem. So if you're looking for a plant that's a little bit taller, they're a good choice for you. Um, but again, they, they're insect, they're, they have these nectar guides to attract the insects, they spread their seeds via ants. Um, and most of the violets, the flowers are edible too. And Virginia bluebells, again, pop these in your garden. They're a beautiful early spring wildflower. They're, they're providing nectar for a lot of our bee species um, and hummingbirds when there's not a lot else out there. They can take some sun as well. Um, so partial sun, you know, is fine for them. But like I said, they're going to die back completely. So they're true ephemeral. So the leaves and everything will be gone by early summer. So you want to plant them, pair them with something like a fern or like uh, coral bells or, or their wild geranium that's going to kind of fill in when that plant disappears. These plants, when the bud is unopened, the flowers are pink. And then once they open, they're purple. And they sort of just hang down like a little bell here. So great for bumblebees especially. And uh, May apple, this is another one, great ground cover. They get this one weird little flower that hangs underneath of the leaf. And their fruits are actually spread by animals. So the entire plant is toxic. In fact, they have developed a skin cancer drug from the leaves of May apple, um, from its chemical properties. The only part of this plant that is edible is when this flower produces a berry, and the berry has to be ripe. So it'll turn, turn like a lemon yellow color. And chipmunks will eat it, and other animals will eat it, but apparently box turtles can reach that berry and box turtles are actually really good at spreading May apple seeds. So when they, they take that seed, that fruit, they eat it, and then they slowly make their way down the trail. And then eventually they go to the bathroom and they spread the seeds and a little bit of box turtle fertilizer. So they're actually really good at spreading May apple seeds. And this one, their leaves will persist, but they do eventually yellow and die back um, in the summer. Strawberry, wild strawberry, uh, spring bloomer, but a great ground cover because it persists throughout the, the spring into fall. And it's a vine, so it'll spread out for you really well. And if you're looking for a ground cover that you can walk on, this is it. You can actually walk on those leaves and they'll, 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 they can take it. The berries are edible. This is actually what we crossed um, with some other species of, of berry to get the grocery store strawberry that we all eat. It's got a really good flavor to it. And then if you want some weird, you know, just some weirdness in your garden, Jack in the Pulpit, you really can't beat it. Uh, Jack in the Pulpit is a spring ephemeral in that the leaves will die back um, in the summer. It has this bizarre looking flower. Um, this is called the spathe. It's basically a modified leaf. And then the spadix. Insects go in to get the pollen way down here. Some of them actually get trapped. Jack in the pulpit does not eat insects though. Um, but they have a little escape hatch out here that they can get out. Now the neat thing about this plant is that while the rest of the plant dies back, the flower produces these red berries. And they have a separate male and female flower. Produces these red berries and that will persist throughout the summer. So um, really neat plant. So let's talk about planting these plants. So why do you want to plant in the fall when we're talking about the, these as spring plants? Well, fall is actually the best time to plant these. So in the fall right now, like I said, they're going to be dormant. Many of them are going to be dormant. They're not going to look like much. So if they have a stalk, it's going to be brown and withered, but some of them, there's nothing. Like there's just a pot full of nothing <laughs> because that plant is, it, it's alive down under the ground. The roots are fine, the roots are growing, but the above ground portion is done. 
but you can plant that that root that's what you're going to plant so these corms bulbs roots you want to make sure that it is a nice firm root that it's not squishy it's not rotted you know make sure it's healthy um, you can cut them you can divide them um, along that corm or the bulb and you want to plant so here's the thing you want to give those roots a chance to develop a little bit and get settled and start to grow when you think about fall ours we've had summer sun beating down on the soil um, it really hasn't gotten cold yet we really haven't had real harsh freezes yet so that soil is still warm the soil in the fall is actually warmer than the spring soil because um, spring you might be coming off some freezes you know so the, the soil temperature is going to be much better for those roots to grow and get established um, so you want to plant them now so in rule of thumb like around six weeks before the ground is going to freeze solid now i know that can be hard around here to sort of figure that out but that's what you're aiming for um, and even because there is no above ground portion of that plant and they're not directing their energy into growing new leaves and growing new flowers this time of year they actually have a ton of energy available to grow roots so it's a great time to plant in the spring they're directing a lot of that energy that's stored in those corms or those bulbs they're directing that energy to sending up stems and making flowers this time of year, they can devote it all to making roots. So that you definitely, this is a great time to plant those species. And whoop, the frost, when it does freeze, it's okay. Because when we get a frost here, it takes a lot of cold weather. It takes several hard frosts for the ground to freeze, right? And where you've planted those plants, that's going to stay unfrozen for quite a long time. And those plants will be fine. Um, you, when you do plant them, remember, they do like it moist. Now, you don't want to water them so much that there's a danger of them rotting. Because remember, they're not, they don't have any leaves above ground. They're not doing photosynthesis. And a plant, when it is taking energy from the sun and using water, and carbon dioxide to make food. It's using a lot of water to do that. So that's drawing water from the soil and then releasing water vapor through its leaves. So it's using a lot of water. When it doesn't have those leaves and it's not going through photosynthesis, it's not using a lot of water. So you do want to water it. You don't want it to dry out, but you don't need to water as heavily as you would if the plant was above ground. So in general, a good rule of thumb is once a week, um, but again, you know, it depends on how much rainfall we're getting. If we're getting rainy days, you don't have to worry about it. Um, don't mulch them right away. And the reason you don't want to mulch them right away is because you want to allow the sun to get to the soil to keep it warm. Um, and that way the roots will have a better chance of growing. So, you know, you want to kind of leave off on the mulch until we get closer to that freeze. So once you start to get closer to that freeze, then yes, you do want to mulch it. And the reason, number one, you're going to protect, you know, the soil itself, you're going to keep water from evaporating too much. But here in Western Pennsylvania, especially, you know how we get like, it'll be above freezing, and then it'll be below freezing at night. And then you'll have some days that are cold and some days that aren't cold, right? We tend to be real susceptible to what's called frost heave. So if you ever walk through the woods and you'll see like the soil just has heaved up and become displaced. And what's going on is little ice crystals are forming in the soil because there's a difference in the air temperature and the soil temperature. You have a lot of freezing and thawing going on and it's creating these ice crystals and they're just like heaving the soil and they're creating all of these air pockets and that can kill these young plants. So to avoid that and to sort of keep the temperature a little bit more stable, you, you do want to mulch that first year so that you're protecting that plant and it doesn't get heaved up by the, these freeze thaw cycles. Does that make sense? Everybody, okay. Um, ah, sorry about that. 
So those of you who are in the Backyard Habitat program, yay! <laughs> and um, those of you who aren't, if you've been here, you know that we really, really, really do encourage you to get these plants, not from the wild if you can help it, because in some places, you know, they're really fighting a battle to stay in the wild as it is with deer and things like that. So you really wanna take plants, get plants that are nursery grown. First, you should try and buy them from a local nursery and try to make sure it's a straight species. So it's not a native R, not a cultivar. Um, here, we do use primarily locally collected seed. So either from our seed banks or from a few other places. Uh, you wanna make sure that it's grown locally if possible. Um, if, it's, if you can't find what you need locally, you can then you know, go to nurseries that have native species that maybe aren't locally grown. Um, and then, you know, if you have to, you can go to like a native R um, if you can't find what you're looking. But whether you're buying them from us or somebody else, try to stress to that landscape place or nursery that you're really interested in the native species and that's been nursery grown. And that lets them know that that's important to you. Um, and it makes it more likely that even if they don't have that now, then maybe they'll stock that in the future. Uh, and of course, you wanna make sure that you're not using any pesticides or herbicides um, on or near these plants, because one of the big jobs these plants have is to be eaten by insects. That's part of their job, and they provide food for a lot of other animals by being food for many insects. So you don't wanna treat them with any kind of pesticide or anything like that. All right, so any questions about the plants themselves before we move on here? I do wanna talk a little bit about iNaturalist um, as part of the program. So iNaturalist is a citizen science or community science program. It is an app that you can put on your phone. And it serves a couple of different functions. Number one, it can help you identify things, whether it's a plant or an insect or what have you. It's a crowdsourced um, identification tool. So this is an app. This is actually a screenshot from my phone, I think, um, that you can basically open up the app. It has a camera function, or you can you know, pull pictures from your um, photo bank on your phone. And you basically upload that picture to the app. So here's a little camera button. Upload the picture to the app. So here is a picture I took of a dogwood leaf right there. Um, take a picture, and you can take as many pictures of you as you want of this, you know, whatever item it is. And it doesn't have to be a plant. It can be anything. It can be an insect. In fact, that's what I like to take pictures of because I think it's a lot of fun. Um, and then once you get the picture in there, it actually has a function down here, the location, where it can use GPS and figure out where you are and geolocate you. If you took a picture last week and you're not standing in the location where you took the picture, you can actually pull up the map and zoom in on the location that you were at. Um, and it will, by your picture, it actually automatically gets the date for you. So get your location. It'll automatically put in the date from the date stamp on the photo. You can manually do that too if you need to. You can add in any notes if you want. And then the best part of this is that what did you see? You just hit that button and it uses an artificial intelligence plus crowdsourcing to get you a possible ID on that, um, on that leaf. So it will come up with, I hit, what did I see? It will come up with a few different possibilities that it thinks it might be. And it will say, you know, this one is really similar to what you're looking at and it's been seen nearby. Or it'll just say, this one's pretty similar, it might be a plant. So you can either say, yes, I think it's one of these, or sometimes it'll just give you the general genus of it. So it might say, well, we think this is a dogwood, but we're not sure which dogwood. And you can select that. Once you do that, you can, you can do nothing else. You can stop right there. But if you really want to be a contributor to community science and this global database of living things, then you can actually upload it. So you save it and you upload it. 
And then it becomes part of this big global database. And then you can have other people that will weigh in on identification. And there are a lot of really expert people in plant identification, insects, things like that, that regularly identify things on iNaturalist. And so they will come in and they'll say, yes, I think it's this, or they'll say, mm -mm, I don't think so, I think it's this. So it's a really cool way to get a, a, a fairly definitive ID on what you're looking at. Now I should mention, if you're taking pictures of plants in your backyard, you definitely want to let them know that this is a cultivated species. This is something you planted, okay? Now, if you take a picture of an insect on your plant, you don't have to do that, because um, that insect is free to go wherever it wants. But that's one thing to keep in mind. We're gonna talk about the projects here in, this, in a moment. But if you are interested in uploading it, save it and it goes into that big database. So you're helping yourself with identification and you're helping to create this larger database. You can also use iNaturalist as a tool. So here at Beechwood, we actually selected um, our location and created it as a place and a project. So that means that whenever anybody visits one of our reserves or visits here at Beechwood, if you were to go out here and you identify something with iNaturalist and upload it on our reserve, it automatically goes into our project umbrella. And so we can, anybody can pull up Beechwood Farms Nature Reserve and see a list of species that has been captured, you know, an iNaturalist here. Um, and we actually have that database so that we can look over the years and see what kinds of animals and plants we've had growing here and if there are any changes. So it's actually really, really cool. If you work with students at all, or even just for yourself, you can, actually, you can create field guides with this. So you can pull up a location like Beechwood, and then you can go in and select what kinds of living things you want to look at. So you can see, oh, well, what kind of insects have been seen at Beechwood? And it'll give you just the insects. So it's a really cool feature. Um, the other thing that you can do is once you find one of those insects, you click on it and it will tell you exactly where it's been seen in the world. It will tell you um, when you're most likely to see it at a certain location. It has a little field guide um, section on it, so it'll tell you a little bit more about that animal. And really importantly, it will tell you if the sighting of that animal is legit. So even though it's crowdsourced, when you submit a sighting, it actually doesn't get bumped up to what's called research grade before it's been corroborated by three other um, sources. So it's, it's, it's a nice way of, of making sure that it's a, that, you know, this is actually this species of fly and not a honeybee, you know, so it, it does a nice job of kind of verifying that kind of stuff. Um, so, I, like I said, I, this is one of mine <laughs> uh, that I threw in here. So this is a six-spotted orb weaver, and you can see that I submitted this, and then this person here verified, yes, that's a six-spotted orb weaver. And if you get enough people verifying it, if it gets all the way over to three out of three, then it becomes a research grade. Uh, so that is uh, just... A little bit of information on one of the ways you can enjoy your yard and contribute something from your yard and a little bit about some of the plants that you can plant now in your yard. Now I know we focused on springtime plants but fall is also a great time to plant any of these um, native plants. So whether it's a fall blooming plant or a spring um, a perennial or ephemeral. Fall is a great time to plant and it's a great time to plant for all those reasons that we just talked about. Um, that the soil is still pretty warm um, and you're going to give your plants a, a chance to establish root systems where you planted them before the frost sets in. And then by the time spring rolls around they're just going to be ready to grow. Ready to, ready to go and ready to grow. <laughs> so I uh, would like to mention that here at Beechwood we are having a plant sale um, through October. So we have some really deep discounted plants. So some of our plants that aren't looking too well right now because they're kind of dying back for the season, they are on like deep discount. 
And even the plants that still look pretty good, they're, they're all discounted um, right now as well. So you can get some good deals here. And it's the same at other nurseries too. A lot of nurseries are trying to get rid of some of their stock this time of year. So um, definitely now would be the time to buy all these plants that you want to put in the ground. So we're going to go ahead. I'm going to take questions from our chat, which I'm, I apologize. I wasn't able to check it that much during the presentation. And also from the audience here. Now, as I mentioned before, I am a last minute fill-in <laughs> for this program. Uh, Roxanne Swan, who is our Native Plant Center coordinator, was meant to give this program. She had a little emergency this morning. If there's something you ask me that I can't answer, we will get that question to her and try to have her get back to you either today or Monday um, so that you can get an answer for that. So um, any questions from the from the folks in the field here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, I actually live in the woods. <laughs> yeah. Someone knows, but I, the, the little area around the house where I've been wanting to get garden and didn't know anything about the state. Um, one of those ground covers, and I should have marked which one it was, look really familiar. Now, I accidentally bought an invasive ground cover from like 3 d auction or something. Yeah. Some friends of mine left the garden and explained that to me. I've been trying to dig it up. And they said, don't even throw it out. Like, but some of them, like, I do see a lot of the garlic comes down. Now, if I'm just taking a walk and I pull it up, do I need to burn that? And I drag it. I mean, I can't okay. just pull it up and just throw it in the pile. Let me repeat your question for the folks online in case they couldn't hear it. So the, and that way you can also correct me if I get it wrong. So the question is, um, that uh, she lives in the like near a wooded area, but in her area that's planted right near the house, um, accidentally planted an invasive ground cover, which is really common. So this is one thing I would like to point out before we go any further. Oftentimes in gardening, our, our concept of ground cover has been a uniform carpet. So a plant that forms a uniform carpet of one plant. And I mean, it does look really nice. The problem is because it easily forms that carpet, it usually means it's pretty invasive and aggressive. And because it's one single plant forming a carpet, you're cutting down on the diversity of species. So you could have a number of different plants in there, all serving as like a ground cover and providing different types of food and flowering times and hiding places. So that's just something to consider in general for um, ground covers. Now, your question was how to get rid of it. Well, how to get rid of that, and even when I'm walking in the woods around the house, when I see a garlic mustard, if I pull it up, got to carry it back with me and, and dispose of it. I mean, I thought somebody said, don't just throw it on the ground anymore. It, it depends on the plant. So I am going to try and type into the chat here. There's a really good resource um that i'm gonna now i'm not the most coordinated person in the world so i'm gonna try and i don't have the actually let me try and get the link here so i'm gonna take the screen off and i am gonna pull up the link the um department of conservation and natural resources um has an amazing website for invasive species and they have all of these fact sheets. So our folks here can see this. I don't think you folks can see it at home, but I'm gonna put it in the chat for everybody. And uh, they have these invasive fact sheets. Let me get this in the chat before I go any further. And they will tell you what the strategy is for different types of plants. And I'm going to see if I can pull up one of these fact sheets. So just so you can see it. So let's go with something that you were asking about. <laughs> so let's see. Oh, you know what? Here's a good one. Periwinkle. Okay. So I'm going to download this because I think that it will be it's adorable looking. Let me let me try and share this with the rest of our folks here, though. I want to make sure. Oh, it's probably money wart or something. We can take a look at it, but let me try and share this with everybody so that everyone can see it. Um, so here we go. Here's one of the 
uh, one of their fact sheets, but they have a whole list of these sheets. And uh, so this one happens to be periwinkle. It also goes by myrtle and vinca. And it's a real common ground cover. And what this will give you is how to control it. And they do give you chemical. We always advocate, if possible, not using chemical controls. But they'll also give you a manacle, ma manual control. So something like a vine like these. And oh, the other nice thing about this is it'll give you some native alternatives for that, um, which we can help you with that too. But with a lot of these vines, so if it's a vine type ground cover, you just pull it and try to pull as much of the root as possible and just keep doing it um, if it's in a smaller area. Really large infestations can be really challenging to get rid of. You kind of have to um, kind of smother them out, cover them. Um, something like garlic mustard. Garlic mustard is a biennial. So the first year of that plant, if you can recognize what the plant looks like in its early stage, if you pull that out, then just pull it. You can pull it, you can throw it on the trail or what have you, and it, it's done. If it gets to the stage where it's sending up, the next year it sends up its flower spike, um, once it's done that, that plant is dead. It's done. It's a two-year plant and it's done. But if that flower gets pollinated and produces seeds, then it's just put a bunch of seeds into the soil. So if you're getting it at an early enough stage before those flowers have been pollinated and set, then you can just take it, pull it, and it's done. Um, but if it's at the stage where it has those seeds, or it's about to get those seeds, garlic mustard, I have seen that like be pulled, sit at the side of the trail, and still like, okay, I'll just grow up this. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's got a pretty big root. But um, if, it, if it has those seeds, that's something you wouldn't want to bag it up and not, you know, throw it in your compost or something like that. So it's just, it's different for, for different plants. And there are strategies, whether it's a shrub, if it's producing berries, if it's a vine, um, if it's a biennial, um, some things like Japanese knotweed are just really hard to deal with. And it just, you have to be really persistent and it's gonna take several years um, to really try and get it under control. Let me see if we have, some questions. So would ephemerals work well under fruit trees? And if they're providing um, partial shade, then definitely. Um, sometimes with the fruit trees, you don't get a real heavy shade. And some of these, um, you know, uh, some of our spring ephemerals don't do well in, you know, full sun um, or even really heavy partial sun. I think, so if you have enough shade, yes. And then also making sure that the soil underneath of the trees is rich enough. Um, that's just something to consider, just making sure uh, that it's a, it's a fairly rich soil under there. Um, and that's also a question we'll pass on to Roxanne. So if I'm missing something, she can let us know, you know, yes, no. Uh, but that would be my answer is that as long as you have a good rich soil under there and that it isn't, you know, not too sunny an area, um, because these woodlands, even though the leaves aren't coming out, there still is a lot of shade just from the trees. Um, so it's not super sunny in there. All right, any other questions from our audience out here? And I don't see any questions from our chat folks. So um, I think I would just end this by saying, um, plant something. <laughs> so it's always better to just get out there and plant something. And, uh, you know, this time of year, great time to plant. If you have any questions, you can always call us, you can email us, we can get you in touch with Roxanne, or try to answer the questions that you have ourselves. But we want you to get these plants in the ground. And the plants that we have up here, our goal is to see them in the ground. That's what we want to see. We don't want to, you know, we love growing them. We do benefit from selling them, yes, but our main goal is to get them in the ground. So that's the important thing right now. So get out there and plant something. <laughs> so thank you, everybody, and take care and have a wonderful weekend.